So thank you all for joining us today for Scrimshaw Folk Art to Fine Art. If you would like to ask any questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat box during or after the program, and I'll be moderating those for Corinne. Our speaker today is Corinne Tanzer. Corinne is a PhD volunteer. We've been very lucky to have them for the past two years work with our archives. Um, they're also a volunteer with Lincoln County Historical Association and on the Wiscasset Old Jail Stewardship Committee, doing good work there as well. They're currently uh, gaining a BA in history at Arizona State University and run a very popular blog on Maritime, Maine, and LBGT plus history. Um, so please do have a wonderful time listening and watching this program. I know it's gonna be fantastic. We've all been looking forward to it. So I will let Corinne take it away. All right, I've uh, got unmuted here. So um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, Dr. K, and um, I want to thank you all for being here today. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here. All right. Oops, sorry about that. Do, 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 do. All right. Um, I want to thank Pajewska History Center for hosting me today. Um, like Dr. Keithan said, I've been a volunteer here for about two years. Um, working in the archives, and I've always been really passionate about maritime history. Um, I'm really excited to um, talk about the art of Scrimshaw this afternoon, um, this dreary, drizzly New England afternoon. Uh, I'll be giving a brief history about Scrimshaw, and I'm going to be doing a deep dive into um, several of my favorite pieces. Um, so due to the anonymous nature of Scrimshaw as an art form in general, um, there's rarely good documentation of who the artist is. So you'll hear me say things like likely and probably and possibly frequently. Um, Scrimshaw art, like so many other pieces of art, is subjective. Um, so these are my best interpretations of that piece is given the evidence. Um, and as Dr. Keithan mentioned, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and I'll answer them as best as I can. All right, um, I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Keithan for um, her help with research, for um, putting this whole program together. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Genevieve Lemoyne at the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum for her assistance, uh, Jennifer Hornsby at the Peabody Essex Museum's Phillips Library for her assistance as well. Um, Pajepski History Center, thank you all for um, just being so supportive and being awesome. Um, SJ Costello for uh, research advice and help, um, and James Tanzer for all of your help with editing and listening to me give this talk several times. And I'd also like to thank viewers like you, um, because this wouldn't be possible without people being interested and passionate in history, and we couldn't do it without people that actually would want to come learn about Scrimshot. So thank you, one and all, for being here today. All right, so let's begin with a familiar face. Um, I'm sure you all recognize this photo of President John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office. And on the Resolute desk here, we can see several pieces of his private scrimshaw collection prominently displayed. During his presidency, Kennedy decorated the Oval Office with many nautical antiques, such as paintings, model ships, and of course, scrimshaw. Prior to Kennedy's presidency, Scrimshaw was still seen as a naive and an almost grassroots art form. It wasn't something featured in fine art catalogs at the time, but it soared in popularity when people noticed their young, charismatic president who often vacationed on Cape Cod was also a Scrimshaw enthusiast. And we have him largely to thank for the modern popular revival of Scrimshaw as a collectible art form. So, before we get much further, I'm sure some of you are wondering, what the heck is scrimshaw anyway? And where does the word come from? So scrimshaw is typically defined as um, engraving or carving in bone or ivory. 
we aren't really sure of the origin of the word. There's a lot of uh, discussion out there, a lot of um, people who can't seem to agree. Some people say that it's a Dutch word meaning to waste time. Some people say that it's a word made up by sailors. It is mentioned in Herman Melville's um, Moby Dick as well as, as a word. Um, and people who practice the art of scrimshaw are known as scrimshanders or scrimshaunters. This quote comes to us from an anonymous whaler on board the uh, brig Orion. Um, all hands employed scrimshaunting. Um, documenting perhaps what downtime on board a whale ship looked like, everybody working on his own projects. So scrimshaw arts were not only made by whalers, but whalers often had the easiest access to raw materials, such as whale teeth and whale bones. Also, the pattern of a typical whaling voyage meant that whaler saw short bursts of action during which a whale was pursued. We see here, illustrated as a Nantucket sleigh ride, um, killed and processed into oil. And there were often long stretches of downtime during which the ship sailed in search of more whales. Whalers only returned to their home ports when their ship's holds were full of whale oil, which was a valuable product used in lamps in nearly every home in America. Because of this laborious pattern of pursuit, excuse me, um, because of this laborious pattern of pursuit, most whaling voyages took anywhere from four to six years. And there have been um, indications that there were some whaling voyages out for as many as 10 to 11 years. Um, and this combination of plentiful raw materials and whale, of whale bone and teeth and long stretches of leisure time on board the whale ships proved to be the perfect setting for the rise of scrimshaw. So how would a sailor go about making a scrimshaw piece? Images were engraved using a pen knife, or as Ishmael tells us in Moby Dick, some have little boxes of dentistical looking implements specifically intended for the scrimshandering business. Images were darkened with whatever was on hand, frequently soot, but ink when the sailor could get it, which is how we get these beautiful polychrome multicolored images. Oops, excuse me. I love this image of the little birds here um, and the little house and the pretty lady in the fashionable dress that's, um, we see this is very typical of scrimshaw art. So now we have a good idea of what scrimshaw is. So now let's look at some more examples. <clears throat> so a lot of the art that we see on scrimshaw pieces are illustrations of the world surrounding whalers. We see whaling ships in action and we do see a lot of ships in general. Some instances, we even have the name of the ship like we do here with this ship, Susan. And this is one of the earliest um, pieces in the collection of the Peabody Essex Museum um, and was cataloged, excuse me, cataloged as a quote, tooth of a spermed whale curiously carved in 1831 when the museum was still known as the East India Marine Society. Sometimes teeth even acted as a travel log of where the ship was going and where it had been. We see here the artist says, uh, illustrated the Susan on the coast of Japan. And this one tells us about where the um, artist carved it and more about that. <clears throat> uh, here we have some more examples of some scrimshaw depicting whaling scenes, um, which is also another popular motif we see a lot of. Um, I like to think that Perhaps these sailors are showing off their ships in a way that suggests, here's what my home for several years looked like. Wasn't she beautiful? They certainly took a lot of pride in the renderings of their ships, and it's easy to see how much care went into them. The ships are always in full sail. They're always fully rigged. They're always sort of looking their best and looking proud. And, and I can see how a sailor might take some, some pride in those ships. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, patriotic motifs like we see here from England, you can tell with the crown here, and from America, um, obviously with Columbia here, um, were popular as well. George Washington was a popular subject. Uh, Lafayette was a popular subject. Uh, 
and the personification of the United States, Columbia, as we see here, also um, known as Lady Liberty with her hand high, um, is another theme that we see a lot of as well. The overarching theme of home and someone taking pride in where they were from is one that shows up frequently in scrimshaw art and it's just one example of what was important to these sailors so far from home. A scrimshaw wasn't just pictures engraved on teeth and a lot of this scrimshaw art made by sailors tends to fall into two sort of general categories. We have one shipboard tools and two guests for friends and family. Uh, whale bones were plentiful and a good replacement for shipboard tools such as fids, which tended to wear down. Um, the fids were used to splice and to work ropes. Uh, you'd kind of work it in between the rope to make new rope, basically. Um, you'd use both fids here and marlin spikes for working ropes. And you can see like, you can't just go out and buy more rope. So you sort of have to, to make do and splice what you can. Um, so you can see if you're out for several years that this would be a tool that would wear down quite frequently. Um, we also have um, an example. This is a seam rubber made from whalebone. And uh, a seam rubber uh, was used to flatten the seams of the sails once they were stitched. So everything would lay flat and nice. Of course, we didn't have irons on board, so you'd use that sort of like a bone rubber for um, letters. Um, so this belonged to a man named Thomas Freeman, uh, who obviously did not want other sailors touching his tools. Um, he took the time to engrave not only his name, so up here he engraved Thomas Freeman, his rubber, and on the back he's engraved, drop it, you bugger, which I think is just hilarious. Um, so another popular gift made by sailors for sweethearts back home were corset busks, which um, in your corset, you'd have a, a little pocket in the front. Um, a busk was a removable stiffener, so you could take it out, launder your corset, and it would still stay stiff and give you this hold and support that you needed. Um, so these um, are often decorated with images of homes and family and hearts and daisy wheels. Got here this example from the Peabody Essex Museum. There's a, a woman and her sailor. Uh, we got some hearts. There's a lady holding a baby. Um, more hearts over here. This is from John F. Kennedy's collection. Some daisy wheels, another picture of a house, just all sorts of just really homey, gentle images. Um, and these were perhaps, I think, the most intimate sweetheart gifts, given that the lady would always be wearing it close to her heart and in her undergarments, no less. These tend to have a lot more engraving and carving than um, objects like whale teeth, for example. Uh, they're often very flourishy, very flowery, um, as we can see here. And you can pretty much see that every inch of the surface is decorated. And I like to think that the wearer was probably very proud to own such a beautiful item made with such a loving attention to detail. Um, you might be wondering why these busks here on the far right, these are from the Colby College Museum of Art, uh, why these are a different color, why these are darker. Um, and these are made from baleen. Um, if you don't know baleen, there's two types of whales. There's baleen whales and toothed whales. Baleen whales are filter feeders. Um, they, they get their prey by swallowing huge amounts of seawater. Um, baleen are keratin filters in their jaws that help filter out seawater so that they can get, eat krill, small shrimp, small fish, things like that. Um, so baleen um, was often, um, minky whales, right whales um, were all whales typically being hunted by whalers at this time. They were baleen whales, are baleen whales. Um, and I, well, um, baleen wasn't as stiff as whale bone, but it was still had some flexibility to it. So it's made of keratin, the same stuff as your fingernails. Um, and it was also a popular scrimshaw medium. Um, but unlike whalebone art, it's just carved. It's typically not inked given the, the nature of it. it's already pretty dark. But I, I love how these look. I love how much detail that, that you can get in a carving without necessarily having to add any ink to it. Um, and baleen would have been a good um, medium for a corset busk too, giving you support and still allowing you to have some range of movement as well. All right, excuse me. Um, intricately constructed knitting swifts, like we see here, that are meant to aid in um, winding yarn, are some of the largest and most elaborate scrimshaw arts that we see. 
Um, they're made up of hundreds of little pieces. They're all held together with ribbons. And I can't imagine being a sailor on board a ship and trying to keep all of these tiny little pieces together in such a chaotic and messy environment. You're just shoving it in your sea chest at the end of the day, working on it when you can until you can gift it to the special lady in your life. Uh, they're meant to be clamped onto um, the edge of a table. Sometimes you see tabletop ones that stand on their own, but I like these here. This is called a cathedral swift. As you can tell, it kind of looks like a cathedral. And I love these ivory hands here. This is from the Mystic Seaport Museum. I just, I love the attention to detail to this. I love how intricate these are and how much time must someone have spent to make these. Um, we don't see as many swifts as we do other items like bodkins or crimpers, um, probably because they were so elaborate and probably too, because they got used and when things get used, they get worn out. Um, so now we have some pie jaggers, um, also known as pie crimpers. These were used to like seal the edges of pastry. If you're making a pie, if you're making like, pa you know, any sort of hand pies. Um, and these like Swifts were meant for everyday use. Um, and it's not uncommon to see broken pie crimpers at auctions, uh, which attests to their, their usefulness. Um, and these are no less elaborate than the Swifts. Um, you can see right here, the snake is so, so delicately carved here. We've got this little wheel here. Um, I love this one that's a hand hold, it's a pie crimper holding a pie crimper. Um, it's just the detail in it is just amazing. And perhaps crafting of these items um, speak to the sailor's longing for home and for domesticity uh, and really speaks to the care with which he would fashion these elaborate gifts. Um, one can only imagine how lonely whaling vessels, excuse me, whaling voyages got um, with inconsistent mail from foreign ports being the only correspondence you would receive at home. And like I had mentioned before, you'd be out there for years at a time without seeing home. So I'd like to share, these are two of my favorite scrimshaw pieces. I, I just find them so sweet and endearing. And if you say these are creepy dolls, I'm gonna shake my finger at you because I think they're <laughs> very sweet. Um, I can't help but wonder um, about the sailors who made them. They're, um, so right here is a, is a puzzle box and a little puzzle. This is from the collections of the Penobscot Marine Museum. Um, it's a little ship, a little whaling ship that's uh, the sailor carved into a puzzle. Um, and then these dolls here are from the collection of the National, excuse me, the Australian National um, Maritime Museum. Uh, they're carved of whale bone. Um, that's the scrimshaw part piece of it. Their little eyes are inked. And the label tells us that um, their hair is real human hair. And we can see how carefully their clothes are crafted. This little girl has lace all up and down her dress. This one looks like it's made out of satin. Um, who's who was using his hair and who made these little dresses were these objects made for someone's child were they made for a niece or a nephew or a family friend we can only imagine and we can only guess i love these examples of as a literal labor of love made in the midst of such grueling work so it wasn't uncommon to find images that were traced or copied out of magazines like we see here. This is from Mystic Seaport. Um, another little love token <clears throat> trinket box here also from Mystic Seaport. Um, and a lot of these images that were traced and also featured on toots um, were images of home and family life. Um, here the artist has copied um, this piece. He's titled it Domestic Happiness. Uh, included his ship on here, which I think really speaks to how much he missed his home and his family, but he's also showing off like, here's how I'm supporting my home and my family as best as I can. Um, we have here a little sailor and on the reverse is his lady dressed in very fashionable clothes. Um, and this, these scenes do look a lot like domestic happiness when compared to the hard work of whaling ships. Um, fairly common too were images of fashionable women dressed to the nines as we saw on the previous slide of the pretty lady in the brightly colored polychrome dress. And perhaps these images offered a little escapism and comfort to these whalers in conditions where every inch of the ship would be covered in dirt and grease and gore and just not a pleasant living environment for years at a time. 
whaling overall is a brutal and cruel and dirty business. And there's something deeply touching about the men who took time out to carve gifts for the people they loved out of such a gruesome industry. Excuse me. Um, Scrimshaw was also popular with some communities um, who had ties to American whalers. And I'd like to share some examples uh, made by different indigenous communities. This curbage board, um, you might recognize this little hand as the um, sort of icon for our um, talk today. Um, this curbage board was held, is held in the collections of the Mystic Seaport Museum. Um, this was made in the 19th century out of a walrus tusk by artist Tassiouk, who's the leader, it was the leader of the Inuit Aveline Mute Group. He worked closely with American whaling captain George Comer, and for over 20 years together, they organized Arctic whaling expeditions. And this cribbage board is a great example of the exchange of their cultures. Cribbage was a popular game played on, on board ship amongst Western sailors, but the board here is decorated with seals right here. We have a walrus, another walrus, and even a hunter in a kayak. I don't know how well you can see that, but hunter in a kayak, more Arctic creatures. The walrus expression here, I don't know how well you can see it, it's so funny. He's the hunter in the kayak has harpooned him in the rear and the uh, whale, walrus is looking back at him being like, what the hell, man? Um, I think the the sort of like animal imagery I think is very, very dear and very sweet. Um, similarly, we have this ivory pipe and this is courtesy the Peary Macmillan Arctic Museum. Um, this is another 19th century example of scrimshaw and it features similar hunting illustrations. We see hunters in kayaks and hunting whales, hunting caribou. And my favorite right here is we have a sled pulled by dogs. And these are all things that this indigenous artist would be familiar with in their daily life. And this was all done in the same carved manner with ink. The little sledge with the dog, like I said, is my favorite part of the piece. Um, sledge dogs were used in the Arctic for over 8,000 years and are still important to Inuit communities today, still used today. Of course, we all know the story of Balto. Um, people still race, the Iditarod races today. Um, and their inclusion on this piece um, certainly speaks to how treasured dog teams were and still are today. And um, Stuart M. Frank's book, Ingenious Contrivances Curiously Carved, by saying that five times fast, um, includes this really unique piece. I love this. Um, this is done by an Australian Aboriginal artist. Unfortunately, we don't know his name. We just know that he was an Aboriginal man who served on board a whaling ship. And he's probably illustrating his experiences here. We see a whale boat full of men hunting a whale, but the sails here are illustrated, um, the, excuse me, the sails here illustrated are ones used on outrigger canoes of the South Pacific. Uh, and this is all rendered in the um, traditional Aboriginal art style called dream time. The main feature of which is these bold zigzag outlines of figures. I love too how he's portrayed the whale it's a simple wedge, but you can tell it's meant to be a sperm whale. And my favorite part of the piece is right here on the back where the artist has included a boomerang. You can see it's kind of bounced off the man here up in the, in the topsails and right over here on the side. Unfortunately, there's not much else we know about these indigenous artists, but it feels like a wonderful connection to be able to look at their art so many years later and be able to study it and appreciate it as fine art pieces and museum quality pieces as well. So this is one of two known scrimshaw pieces that we know that was done by someone from Cape Verde. Uh, Martha's Vineyard historian Skip Finley asserts that around 30 to 40 percent of whaling crews were black men. But due to the anonymous nature of so many scrimshaw artists, it's hard to say for sure when we're looking at a piece of scrimshaw that's done by a person of color. But we know that this was made by a person of color. Um, Jaime Fortes was one of four brothers from Cape Verde who made their way to New Bedford to join their uncle who had immigrated a few years before. Fortes made this piece of scrimshaw aboard the schooner John R. Manta, which sailed from April to August of 1917. Um, engraved on the back are his own name and the names of two of his brothers, Antonio and Enrique, 
and their uncle, Valentine Fermino, who is also a career writer himself. In his book, Stuart M. Frank suggests that this piece was made as a celebration of the stateside reunion of the family, and it is certainly possible that this is the case. At this point, all four men had been involved in different whaling voyages, all leaving at different periods of time. And, and how exciting it must have been to be reunited all together after so many years apart. The fourth brother from Cape Verde joined the family not long afterwards. And the ancestors of the Ferminos and the Fuertes still live in the New Bedford area today. Um, in fact, this tooth here was a family heirloom and it was passed down in the Fermino family for many years until it was donated to the New Bedford Whaling Museum in 2005. It's a great example of not only a personal family history, but of the history of Cape Verdean whalers as well. This pointillism style is not uncommon, um, but it's not as popular as sort of the engraved etchings that we see um, typical scrimshaw art that we've seen previously. Um, I personally love the style. I love the simplicity. I love that it was probably more time consuming than straight etching. A lot of the pointillism styles were often traced. Uh, was, the sailor would take like a magazine um, picture and then poke it with a needle. Um, but this doesn't look like, this looks like it was freehanded. It doesn't look like it was something that was traced from like magazine clippings. Um, and on here, Fortes is included. So he has his initials here. He's got the manta. He's got the um, rising sun. And he also has these really beautiful clasped hands. Um, a theta rings featuring clasped hands um, go all the way back to Roman times as a symbol of love and affection and were used in wedding rings. And many Victorian era gravestones feature male coded and female coded clasped hands that are like this um, engraved on them as well. However, these clasped hands uh, can also have another meaning. It can be used as a brotherhood or a friendship symbol. Usually you can figure out the meaning of the hands based on one object context and two, if one of the hands is meant to be a female hand. Gender neutral hands typically indicate friendship or brotherhood, while opposite gender hands tend to indicate romance. We see here with Fortes's engraving, the hand on the left has some sort of flowy, feminine um, sleeve or ribbons, while the one on the right looks like a man's cuff. We can't say why he chose this romantic iconography on the piece, but we can look at other examples um, of class hands on a couple more pieces of scrimshaw. Um, so, going on, Jonathan Blaney Walton was born in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1827 and was a young man of about 20 or 21 when he joined the crew of the Carolina Augusta. Walton is not on the original crew list for the 1846 voyage, which indicates that he probably joined the crew at a later date, but I haven't been able to find when or where. Later in life, he signs aboard a whaling vessel called the Cavalier for its 1855 to 1858 voyage. And like Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr. says, it is there that the paper trail of his life has run out from what I've been able to find. Um, I haven't been able to find marriage records or death records, or I haven't even found them in the census past 1950. Um, and it is highly probable that he did die at sea like so many sailors did. Um, however, though we know little about his life on land, he left behind these beautiful works of Scrimshaw and even a poem created on board the Carolina Augusta that give us insight into his thoughts and his feelings. So during his time aboard the Carolina Augusta, Walton intricately carved three sperm whale teeth. Here's one of them. Uh, we saw the other one previously when we were talking about uh, Columbia and Lady Liberty. Um, so he carved uh, three sperm whale teeth, all decorated with multicolored polychrome ink. At first glance, this one, um, which is currently in the collections of the Peabody Essex Museum, looks like every other example of sailor-made scrimshaw that we've already seen. But what makes this piece so charming and so remarkable was that it was given as a token of friendship and deep affection to the captain of the Carolina Augusta, James B. Creamer. How do we know this? Because Walton wrote a poem to tell us so. A poem in and of itself is remarkable, as is having solid provenance of an artist. 
this poem tells us that he carved it, who he carved it for. And not only that, but he makes careful note of the iconography he's engraved. Let me just go back here really quick. Uh, such as the goddess of liberty of who America is its holy queen, right here, and the sword of faith and anchor of hope, right here. And he even tells the whale's tooth in the last stanza, but now through many hands you've passed, you are in J.B. Creamer's care at last. He says with you he'll not part to man while of a good ship he has command. And my favorite part of this piece is right here at the bottom. Sorry, that keeps popping up. It's right here at the bottom, um, which Walton in his poem calls the two hands of friendship pierced into one. And I've really zoomed in on this, but this is, you know, about hand size whale's tooth. And it's so small, you can barely notice it unless you know where to look. All right. And... So at the Peabody Essex Museum, they have an interactive exhibit set up and they have blown up images of the different icons on the tooth. So this is from the Peabody Essex Museum's exhibit. Um, so we can look closely at these hands featured on the tooth uh, made by Walton. And we can see that the hand on the left is wearing a bracelet and is much slimmer than the hand on the right. As I mentioned previously, um, female coded hand and a male coded hand tended to be met romantically. And it is possible that this is queer coded art where Walton is expressing his love and his desire for his captain. By writing in his poem that these are hands of friendship, but actually illustrating a different meaning, very much romantic iconography here and hearts on the opposite side of the tooth as well. Um, Walton performs the same sort of roundabout dance that all queer people throughout history have done communicating and expressing desire through codes and double meanings. Walton also included these same hands of friendship um, on another tooth, which we can see here. Um, unfortunately, this is from a 1984 auction catalog. This is the only picture that we know of that exists of this. Um, it went to auction in 1984 and has not surfaced since, but if, so if you or anybody you know is in possession of this tooth, please let me know because I would love to see it up close. Please take a picture of it. <laughs> um, so this one features an unidentified couple. We can see them down here at the bottom. Um, and it is likely that this tooth was made as a gift for well. Uh, excuse me, this tooth was made as a gift as well. Um, so we have the unidentified couple here. We've got a cross between them. Um, and then we've got the hands of friendship pierced into one up here. Again, they look pretty female-coded, male-coded to me. Um, uh, Frank M. Stewart writes um, that perhaps Walton and his wife are illustrated on there, that it's like an autobiographical piece. Um, but I, like I said, I've yet to find any evidence that Walton married. And I think I'm fairly certain that these were all given as gifts as well. So I, I think this is not him illustrated, but rather somebody that he knew. Um, but it is really interesting to note that um, both iconography appears on this, a gift featuring a couple, and this, a gift to his captain. Um, like I said, this tooth is currently on display at the Peabody Essex Museum um, in an interactive exhibit. You can read a transcription of Walton's poem, examine it yourself, make your own call, but that is my interpretation. So we're gonna go a bit locally now to here in Brunswick. And visitors of the Schofield Whittier House um, under the jurisdiction of the Pajepskit History Center might have noticed this large mother of pearl turbo shell in the parlor. It is elaborately engraved with a fully rigged steam ship. That is the HMS Himalaya. And we also have General Omar Pasha. And the artist tells us that the whole of the engraving executed with a common pen knife. Um, since the Schofields were a Mariner family, we can assume that perhaps like J.B. Walton, a sailor made and gifted this item to Alfred Schofield or maybe another member of the family. Um, but however, the Schofields were merchant mariners and not whalers, and their sailors had far less leisure time than they would the average whaler. Merchant ships had to get from point A to point B very quickly. You're moving goods, you're moving mail, you're moving people. So you, 
voyages were a lot shorter. You had a lot less downtime than whaling voyages where you're out there for many years at a time. You have a lot of downtime while you're waiting for whales to pop up. If we look at the subjects in grave two, this isn't typical symbolism for something that we would see in New England, um, especially. So we've got a bit of a mystery, but since the artist has helpfully included both Omar Pasha's name and the name of the ship, the Himalaya steamship and the tonnage, which is very helpful when trying to figure out, find a ship, um, we can do a little bit of research and we find that the Himalaya is a was a troop transport during the Crimean War, and that Omar Pasha was the general who led the Ottoman Empire to victory over Russia. So we have a date, and while we can confidently say that this piece was made sometime after 1856, and we can assume that it was probably obtained by Alfred Schofield when he lived with his family in Liverpool. Doing a little bit more digging, I found several more similarly engraved shells uh, with the same sort of handwriting, the same sort of iconography. Um, and these are attributed to artist C.H. Wood, who was active during the 1850s and the 1860s. Excuse me. Um, he was known for engraving shells with a pen knife and often had written on the item that it was engraved with a pen knife. Um, and he sold his pieces from local docks. Wood had his work exhibited um, at the Great, and this is in England, by the way, so um, in definitely English art and not New England, like we see with our, our previous Grimshaw pieces. Um, so work, uh, Wood had his work exhibited at the Great Exhibition of 1851 and at the International Exhibition of 1861, and even gifted pieces to Queen Victoria. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any solid evidence that Alfred Schofield bought this piece in Liverpool. I'd love to find a receipt or some sort of bill of sale, but I haven't found anything yet. So, uh, so far, this is just my best guess given what information I've been able to uncover. Um, but what I find interesting about this piece, let me go back to the, I just love how this looks. And what's really interesting about this is that we're seeing a shift now from scrimshaw and engravings being seen as like sailors, arts and crafts to like, home, you know, homey items to like, this is a desirable artistic object that somebody bought and brought back and displayed in his home. And if uh, you'd like to visit the Pajewski History Center and visit the Schofield Whittier House and see for yourself, um, we can uh, check out Pajewski History Center. Oh, <laughs> all right. So now I'm gonna talk for a minute about modern scrimshaw because this isn't, oh, excuse me. This isn't an art form that's gone away. People are still doing scrimshaw today. Um, today, it's often made of, obviously, you know, there was a moratorium on whaling in New England uh, in the 1980s. So obviously, uh, modern scrimshaw isn't made from whale bones, um, but it's made from like fossil ivory, a lot of mastodon tusks, um, bones from like deer. Um, we see antlers too a lot, especially here in New England, a lot of scrimshot antlers, which are really cool pieces. Um, and many fine modern pieces can fetch upwards of a thousand dollars or more for depending on the material. Fossil ivory and really elaborate engravings tend to go for a lot much more than, um, you know, like an antler engraving. Um, and many of the motifs are the same today as they were a hundred years ago. So you can easily go out buy a piece by a modern scrim shander, It'll have a ship on it. It'll have mermaids, pretty ladies, patriotic themes. Um, and like sailors of the 19th century, we can see what is important to modern scrimshaw artists by what they choose to make art of. Um, I found one modern scrimshaw artist who does portraits of animals on different um, artists, or excuse me, on different mediums uh, like fossils and, and antlers. Um, and I, I love this year. Uh, you might recognize this as stormtroopers from the Star Wars films. Um, so this artist is very passionate about Star Wars, wanted to include their images on a mastodon tooth. Um, and I, I love this. I think this is as American as it gets. You have a film that has arguably had a huge influence on pop culture. Um, everybody here knows about Baby Yoda, I think. And everybody, I think, can recognize a stormtrooper. Um, and then an, an arguably American art style like Scrimshaw. Um, this isn't something that we typically saw before um, whalers. 
and it's definitely something that's prevalent amongst New England whaling communities. So we've got two very like uh, the intersection of like American pop culture and American folk art. And I just, I love this piece in particular. I think it's hilarious. Um, for the Star Wars fan that has everything, right? Get them a, a scrimshaw mastodon tooth. Um, this is another modern example. This I bought at the um, gift shop of the Main Maritime Museum. Um, this is a great example of done by a uh, local artist. I think it was bone, it might've been bone or antler. I don't remember. Um, but it's a great example of like modern scrimshaw done in the traditional style. We see the bow, ship, water, waves, all that good stuff that we love about scrimshaw. Um, and as a fun aside, if you ever come across a scrimshaw piece and wonder, is this antique? Is this modern? Um, I don't know how well you can see this on your end, but down here, the artist has signed his piece. Um, and that's not something that we see on antique pieces. Whalers typically did not sign their pieces. There's hardly ever names on pieces, um, but modern pieces will almost always have the artist's signature on them. And which we can see right here. Maybe you can, I'm not sure. So um, art communities are not without the risk of forgeries uh, and scrimshaw collection is no exception. Um, good art dealers, modern artists will advertise their pieces as being modern, but on um, maybe ivory that was obtained from Africa pre-ban, um, fossil ivory, things like that. Um, and they'll indicate what the material the tooth is made out of. Um, unscrupulous dealers, however, will um, they'll cast false teeth or tusks in resin or plastic and they'll age them artificially to make them look like antique pieces or modern pieces on bone or ivory. Um, there's many guides out there to help you be aware of what you're buying um, if scrimshaw is something that you're interested in collecting. Remember, just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's the real deal. I know uh, fellow antiques enthusiasts here in New England can commiserate about the struggle of finding like a really cool piece that you've been looking for forever. And then you look at it up close and it's a modern reproduction made to look old. And we definitely see this here. Um, some red flags uh, uh, like that you can tell right off the bat if you're looking at um, a piece of fake Shaw as it's known or like a piece of real scrimshaw. Um, one, so the artist assigned it here. Again, that's not something that we would see on antique art. Um, we can see near the tip and near the base that has been artificially aged. These aren't natural wear lines. They're lines that were carved into this piece of plastic to make it look like it was an actual piece. Um, and this was found on eBay um, being advertised as an unauthentic piece. And um, when you look at a lot of scrimshaw, you can kind of tell right away if, whether what's an authentic piece or not. Um, and this is not an authentic piece. Um, it's a little hard to tell in this picture, but the overall surface is really, really shiny, which speaks to it being plastic or resin. Modern um, scrimshaw, they use like soft cloths. And same with antique scrimshaw too. You would use, you would sand it down very carefully with soft cloths, but it wouldn't necessarily apply like a wax or a sheen to it, which um, we can see here. Um, so it like, it's, it's a good entry level if you're interested in, in collecting scrimshaw, but don't necessarily want to participate in having animal parts around. Uh, but don't pay thousands of dollars for a piece being advertised as authentic. Like take your, take your time, do your research. Um, there's a lot of good fakes out there now. Um, and some have even made their way into museums, which I think really speaks to the interest of scrimshaw as a, as a fine art piece where one, we have fakes being made and two of these fakes are making their way into museums as authentic pieces. Um, so it is, it's fascinating to see how art evolves over time and how sailors took scraps and made something beautiful out of them that are seen in museums and studied around the world. Scrimshaw in particular provides excellent examples of the intersection of folk art and fine art. And as I mentioned before, we can learn a lot about what was important to so many of these sailors by what they chose to engrave. It's a neat little window into this microcosm of a world that was so different from the mainstream society at the time. Already we can start to see modern day examples of this folk art to fine art pipeline um, and an art world that's different from mainstream society. 
um, especially uh, if we're looking at things like graffiti, for example. Um, Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Banksy all started as graffiti artists and street artists and are now considered fine artists whose pieces command high prices. Um, Herring and Basquiat especially both belong to marginalized communities and looked through society through their unique point of view. In 2017, Basquiat's untitled painting of a skull sold at Sotheby's for $110.5 million and was the sixth most expensive work sold at auction. The same year, Keith Herring's 1982 untitled on um, metal also sold at Sotheby's, excuse me, Sotheby's for over $6 million. And of course, who can forget Banksy's work that shredded itself in the frame as soon as it sold for $25 million uh, in 2021. Um, there's also a good number of modern art pieces on display in museums um, around the country that feed their elements of graffiti art. If you think like drippy lines, really bold, bright colors, bubble letters, and graffiti art has gone from something that I would argue is folk art to fine art museum pieces. And who knows how art will progress in time and what art forms will remain popular. With the rise of AI generated art, perhaps physical art forms will become more prevalent again. And who knows, maybe in 100 years, we'll see a revival of girls camp friendship bracelets as a fine art form. So thank you so much for having me today. I really hope you enjoyed um, my presentation as much as I enjoyed giving it. And I'll put my ad email address here on the screen again. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, shoot me an email. If you just want to talk about Scrimshaw, um, let me know. And thank you so much. And thank you again uh, for Jessica History Center. Thank you, Corey. That was really wonderful um, and incredibly engaging. Uh, we have some questions, if you wouldn't mind um, taking them. Um, David asks, what's the legality of owning whale scrimshaw pieces today? Yes, um, it's tricky. Um, gosh, um, I think I'm going to call on Jamie to help me answer this because since he works at the Art Museum, he's a better idea of um, legality. I, I forget what exactly you can own it, but it has to be from before the Marine Mammal Protection Act of, I think, was it 19... 80. Boy, on the spot. There, there is a marine, Sorry, there is a Marine Mammal Protection Act, absolutely. And I I I can't even it was a 20th century uh act. So you can't own today uh, a, a seal carcass that washes up on the beach. You can't own baleen that washes up on the beach. You can't own any part of a marine mammal today. But be before that time, before the Marine Mammal Protection Act went into effect, you can own. Uh, a piece of art, a piece of scrimshaw that was carved before that time. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any surviving examples of votive scrimshaw, like containing prayers or votive images, uh, maybe more spiritual or, or religious? Oh, you know, that's a really great question. Um, I haven't seen any in my in my research. I'm sure there must be some out there. Um, I'm going to plug this book really quick. So this is, oh, um, so the, the book I reference a lot is Ingenious Contrivances, Curiously Carved. It's by Stuart M. Frank, and it's collections of the, mystics, excuse me, the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Um, he doesn't have any votive pieces mentioned in there. I'm sure they must exist. Um, I know that like votive ships used in churches are still, um, we see a lot of examples of those, but I haven't seen any on Scrimshaw, but now that's something that I definitely want to investigate more. Thank you for that question. Uh, Seamus wants to know, um, how common was gifting Scrimshaw to captains and officers? You you went over that one beautiful piece, which you went into detail with, which <laughs> obviously seemed quite unique, but just the concept of gifting Scrimshaw to captains or officers, was that common? You know, I, I haven't been able to find much more information. And this is the this is the tricky thing with Scrimshaw is that it's so anonymous. So we have all these beautiful pieces that that we just know nothing about. Um I it's like sailor to sailor gifts were a lot more common than like sailor to captain. There was definitely a hierarchy on board ships, um, even you know, well into the 20th and 19th century where 
captains and didn't really mingle with the crew as much. Um, so J.B. Creamer's um, gift from J.B. Walton, I think is a really interesting example of like sort of blurring those boundary lines um, Cause it's not, and it's not something I've, I've ever seen before in my maritime research. So thank you for that question, Seamus. This is a really great question from SJ. Uh, with scrimshaw often falling into common object types like teeth and ship tools and busks, et cetera. Um, they're curious to know what the most unusual piece of scrimshaw that you've seen is that breaks away from those expected objects. Oh, sure. Um, one piece that I saw at the Peabody Essex Museum um, recently, there was a little child's chair that was made mostly of wood, but had whalebone parts and ivory pieces in it. And the, the captain had, he had it made in New Bedford for his little daughter. Um, so he gathered up all the pieces and brought it to New Bedford um, and, and even like engraved her name on it. I think her name was Susan. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another really unusual piece. Um, there was also, um, I saw a lot of bird cages, which were really interesting. Um, and it was really, so there was one that I saw that was a bird cage that also had the birds still in it. And that's also at the Peabody Essex Museum. There was, it was a bird cage made for an African parrot and the deceased parrot was still stuffed, obviously, and like <laughs> on display in the frame. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot of like, home goods like that. Um, but the, the little child's chair was definitely like the most unusual, but like sweet thing. Um, also the dolls that I shared, I I'd, I'd never seen dolls like that before. Um, and those are from Australia. And I, I find those just like so charming and endearing. And I think that's, I think probably the most unusual piece of scrimshaw that I've seen. That's not really like a, a busk or a swift or, or something like that. So thank you for that question, SJ. Um, I'm going to skip way down to the end because there is an interesting question um, from Bonnie. Have you ever seen a depiction of a same gender couple in Scrimshaw? I I have funny story. So I have I have not seen a depiction of a same gender couple, but th there's like a, a third sort of um, category of Scrimshaw art of um, uh, how do I put this delicately? very lonely sailors who are depicting things that they would have liked to engage in. Um, so <laughs> uh, my friend SJ Costello shared uh, one time a piece of a mermaid with her quintail fins wrapped around the legs of a nude sailor. Uh, I found another piece of um, a pan-like figure engaging in sexual acts with a woman. Um, so I haven't I haven't seen any same gender couples, but definitely have seen like a lot of very um gosh, I don't know how to erotic. Say, how to, erotic, yes. Thank you. I was gonna say horny. I'm like, that's not the salad. A lot of erotic <laughs> um art is also on these scrimshaw pieces. Obviously, I didn't share any of them here today, but if you'd like to see them, email me and I will send them to you. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you for that question. But I'm I'm always on the lookout for, you know, marginalized group, people of color. Um, say, oh, you know what? I lied. I did see a same gender couple, but they were sisters, like, and, and they were written like the sisters. So, but not like, you know, male, male or, you know, explicit female love. Um, just a couple more. I think we have time for a couple more. Um, sure. Have you ever seen a piece of scrimshaw made by more than one person? So like a collaborative um, or a patchwork of different people's um, contributions? You know, no, I haven't, but you know, that's definitely something I want to keep a lookout for. Um, like I said, it's the pieces are are so anonymous that there there is a chance that there is like, um, you know, somebody could have started a piece, given it to his friend, and he could finish it. But we, like I said, we don't we don't know, and we so rarely have the people's names to begin with. It's so hard to tell if something is a collaborative art or if you know something was just done by one one guy sitting on his sea chest in the forecastle. So thank you for that. Um, Rose has a great question. Um, given the time period and the nature of the industry, um, she would expect a more memento mori themes. Why do you think that most Scrimshaw focuses on themes of patriotism, love, and domesticity instead? Ooh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so sailors in general sort of walk the line between like 
not quite living and not quite dead. They were definitely marginalized in society. I think even today, a lot of sailors feel a bit marginalized from society. Um, there, there's always the chance that you're not going to come back from a voyage, especially on a whaling voyage. Um, that Nantucket sleigh ride image I shared with you before, a Nantucket sleigh ride refers to um, when you harpoon the whale. It, so whaling was done in little, little rowboats, basically, right? So you have your big ship parked slightly offshore. You all get in your whale boats. You go whale, you go row out to whale it, harpoon the whale. Whale doesn't always die immediately upon harpooning, right? So you'd harpoon it, whale goes swimming away with you and your whole crew of boat behind it. And that was called a Nantucket sleigh ride. Um, so whaling was very, very dangerous work. Whales are smart. They're big. They don't want to be killed. <laughs> so, um, and sailing like in general too, like with even with maritime, you know, the skull fields, there's always a chance that you're not going to come back from this trip. So every trip is treated as like, this might be my last time. And I think because sailors are always confronted with that mortality um, every day, you, you're absolutely beholden to the wind and the waves and the weather. There's, there's nothing you can control. Like, you know, they, they say like a farmer plans, but a sailor acts. So um, I think since they're being confronted with, with their imminent, with death every day, that in your downtime, you don't want to be reminded of that. Uh, so you're going to, going to do things that make you think of home. And, uh, and in the case, maybe you die at sea, but your belongings are able to make it back to your loved ones. And your loved one has this really nice memento of like a really nice domestic scene rather than a memento mori with a, with a skull and crossbones. So that was a really great question. Thank you for that. Yeah. So in other words, it, Scrimshaw was, a, it was kind of escapism. Um, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's like so many, and I, you know, it's funny. I, the, the only like reference to death I've really seen is, um, gosh, there was one poem that was like death to the sailors and greasy luck to the whalers or something like that. Um, but you don't, you don't see a lot of death imagery related with sailors. I think that they're, they, they know that they could die at any moment. So they're just going to live life to the fullest as best they can and leave their, their loved ones a, a really nice memento. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there are lots of comments um, about how wonderful this was. Um, oh gosh, and thank I you. would like to echo that. And thank you again so much for giving your time and knowledge to PHC and all of our viewers and supporters. Um, for all of you who are on the call today, um, just to let you know, you'll get a, a link to the recording of this within a week um, so you can watch it again. Um, I think it's worth watching again, actually. I'm probably going to watch it again. Um, oh, thank so thank you all for attending and, and thank you again, Corey. This was really wonderful. We hope to see some of you um, at a future uh, program that we're giving. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.